so I spent most of 2006 in this dark psychological cave of depression and post-traumatic stress and wondering whether or not anything I had done and risked my life for in the previous year had contributed anything of value. And I had no clue what I was going to do with my life, but I sensed that I wasn't done with Iraq yet. And after um, 10 months of surgeries and braces, twice in one life, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, um, I heard from an Iraqi friend of mine um, who wrote to me after being, he had been walking out of the green zone one day, he had been helping us implement a $130 million program for USAID to, to rebuild the schools. And he was walking out of the green zone one day and was identified by a militia. And the very next day he came home and found the severed head of his dog on his front steps with a note pinned to it saying that his head would be next. He took the note to USAID for whom he had worked loyally for, for years and with many awards. And they told him, that's unfortunate. We can't do anything for you. We'll give you one month unpaid leave, at which point we're going to give your job to somebody else. They basically fired him. He gathered what he could and with his wife fled to the Gulf and wrote to me. And I was I was basically this depressed little wreck that <laughs> couldn't offer anything to him, I didn't think. Um, but as I was lying in bed, it, everything started to crystallize, and I realized, well, this is crazy. I mean, I, I have you know, some connections. I could write something. I could try to do something to help him. And so I started writing an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times about his story. And I thought that my involvement with his story and with his life would end after it published, that maybe it would raise his profile a little bit and he would get into an embassy. I didn't know the first thing about refugee resettlement. What ended up happening, happening after it ran was that article got translated into Arabic, immediately rifled and fired through the diaspora of other Iraqis who had been helping us and who had suffered similar fates. And within days, I started getting emails from other close friends of mine who I hadn't been in, in touch with. And I just started, I opened up Excel and started putting their names into a list. In February of 2007, I brought the list down to the State Department. The list was 40 names long, uh, only of my former colleagues, and asked them what they would do. And they said that they would prioritize the processing. That's a <laughs> lovely term. but um, What has happened since then, it, is this recurring succession, of, uh, or an escalating succession, I should say, of me basically feeling like, OK, that's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm done with it. Like, I've, I can't do anything else. A year and a half later, our list is now 1,300 names long. It is the largest, most comprehensive list of Iraqis who are suffering as a consequence of helping the United States. And every single day, we get emails either from Marines or soldiers or from the Iraqis themselves who are telling us their life stories, sending us the scans of their ID badges, their, which they can't get without a background check from our US government, um, award letters, photos with our ambassadors over there doing translation work for them. And what we've done. Uh, over in that period of time is I recognized very quickly I would have no capacity to help all of these people myself. And what I realized that op-ed did was is scratch a very desperate surface and all of this need bubbled up from the Iraqis. And there are a lot of Americans in this country who want to do something to help with the Iraq war. And almost Within a few weeks uh, of the idea forming, I had uh, several law firms, uh, white shoe law firms um, that have contributed nearly 200 attorneys and well over 12,000 pro bono hours now. So we're at a point now where we have a lawyer who has been trained in the ins and outs of refugee resettlement who can advocate for every refugee on my list. And it is the, this very large pressure mechanism um, where 
we have these great law firms that are basically pressuring the State Department and Homeland Security to try to push these cases through. Um, by the time we were a year old, we managed to resettle and get to the U.S. around 110 Iraqis who have helped us. But that being said, the same number of Iraqis have written to us in the last, I think, 10 days or so. Um, one of the, the other developments um, is that because we're so small, we've just been trying to find partners because a number of people have fortes that we don't have. And so um, we have you know, Upwardly Global, which is based in, in San Francisco here, that they try to help the Iraqis find meaningful employment once they get here. Um, but the other thing is that we just launched uh, Netroots uh, on our site, which is a Ning-powered uh, social activism hub. And if you go to all of the main refugee advocacy uh, NGO websites, and click on how to help, you'll be given two options, which is mainly, uh, more, more often the case than not, to contribute money or to sign up for a mailing list that that organization may shake you down for money later. <laughs> and we wanted to give people another, another option. Um, and so what we've done now is um, provided them an engine by which they can organize into groups in its first two weeks. Hundreds of Americans have signed up. They've, they're forming chapters all over the country. These chapters will be choosing to do advocacy. They'll sponsor Iraqi families that have come here. Um, and we see no signs of that slowing. We haven't done any publicity on it. It's just we feel like this is, this, this is the American surface that we've scratched. Uh, and people who write to us every day to, to say that this is the first issue in the war that they understand clearly enough to take ownership on. Now. It seems to me, to, to get back to the notion of trust, that if we can't let these Iraqis in, and that's the, been the position of the White House, is that we can't expeditiously resettle them because we can't let in a terrorist, then we, we've dropped our moral compass. And we've, we have, I think we run the risk of after eight years of a Manichaean approach to the world, where everything is very clearly black and white and into, into two camps. If we get to the point where we see Yagdan, the Iraqi who himself was fleeing terrorists, if we see him as a threat, then I don't see what values there are that we have to protect against terrorism. Mm -hmm. we're, we're getting to a point where we will lose the war on terror if we can't let these people in swiftly. And yet we've created, the government has announced these programs where they claim to honor our moral obligation to these people, but it takes a year and a half, two years to get in. And so what, we're, what we've been pushing for is the, the, to look into what we are capable of as a nation. Twelve years ago, we airlifted out 7,000 Iraqis from the north who were seen to be U.S. affiliated. We flew them to a military base in Guam and process them there in 90 days. And they're all American citizens now who have been helping us out. But sadly, I think we run the risk of, of, letting, of seeing these children that I saw in Fallujah who were so innocent uh, and who had so much potential in them if we get to the point where our senses are so clouded, I, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous point in our foreign policy, I think. And I think that the, the, the notion or the, the concept of resettling these Iraqis and recognizing that our friends are our friends is the clearest signal that we can send to the world that we haven't lost our, our senses and our compass. And I'll, I'll end it there. I'm so used to answering questions, but I just get to drone on at all of you. So thank you for your time. Though.